at the same time, Minho University in Portugal. So he is wearing double hats. <laughs> it must be very busy. He is also a coordinator of the BA and MA programs in IR and diplomacy at Portugal University in Porto, in Portugal. And he is a coordinator of the research group Democracy and Governance for the 21st Century. He is teaching IR theory, political science, international responsibility, and he is actively researching democratization processes, European studies, identity issues, and social constructivism. He received his PhD from Universidad de Nova de Lisboa uh, with his thesis, A Constructivist Perspective on EU's Democracy Promotion in Turkey. And he also turned this into a wonderful book. If you are working on Turkey and EU relations, you should consult uh, his book as a, as a main source. He has published in national and international IR journals and participated in several conferences worldwide and uh, has been awarded with several prizes and scholarships. I'm going to show you the cover of his book, EU's Democracy Promotion in Turkey, which was published in 2015 by Nota de Rodape in Paris. And his current article, many congratulations for this one. Thank you, thank you. Very recent one, uh, foreign presence and export performance, the role of Portuguese commercial diplomacy was published by the International Trade Journal. Uh, this is wonderful. So dear Andre, uh, if I left anything out, please remind me. No, not at all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you are an excellent <laughs> academic and an excellent friend also, a great person. Um, so it's an honor for me to welcome you today. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you very much uh, for this kind uh, presentation. Um, and uh, well, first of all, good evening, everyone. Again, uh, first and foremost, let me thank you, uh, thank Professor Didem for this kind invitation and to all of you who decided to join this session, which I hope that meets your expectations for a Friday evening plan. Um, Professor Didem is a very dear friend, friend of mine, someone who I really admire, not only as an academic, but also as a human being. So uh, thank you very much for this invitation uh, and for the very kind and generous presentation. Uh, I, uh, it, it is always an honor to talk to international students, especially uh, Turkish students, uh, Turkish colleagues, um, and even more specifically uh, to Izmir University, uh, since Izmir was the first city that I visited in Turkey lots of years ago, so I have this kind of emotional uh, <laughs> connection with Izmir. You have a, a lovely, a lovely city, and well, so it's it's really uh, an honor. I'm just um, it's just a pity that we cannot do this uh, in presence. Uh, well, actually, my my presence there in Turkey, but also uh, Professor Didem's uh, presence here in in Porto. Uh, well, um, as Professor Didem, uh, well, uh, already, well, Professor Didem already presented me well with lots of attributes. Uh, my name is Andre Matos, uh, and uh, actually, uh, democracy has been one of the issues that I've studied. Now I'm a little bit more focused on, as you've seen in this, my, this, my. Uh, um, my latest article on uh, trade, commercial, economic diplomacy uh, due to an international project that I'm involved in, uh, more specifically talking, um, looking at the Portuguese experience, uh, which is something that I've, I've, uh, I've, I'm enjoying really much. Um, but uh, I also uh, study or I keep uh, looking at Turkish reality, the Middle East in general. Early this morning, I had the opportunity to talk about the future of Syria in an event um, hold, held at Kolesi uh, University as well, uh, with lots of other academics and practitioners. It was really interesting. Well, but now I'm here to talk about uh, democracy. Um, and I would like to share my screen if that's okay that it helps with some, um, some figures and images. 
how is um, the, the uh, uh, theoretically speaking, how is this um, most of my uh, well, the theoretical work that I've developed my thesis is some things that I've added in the, in the meanwhile. And therefore, here we are uh, talking about democracy. So if you want to uh, ask something, you can interrupt me or you can keep your questions until the end of the presentation. It's really up to you. Uh, do as you feel more comfortable. Uh, and uh, let's uh, look a little bit um, at this um, well, this this concept. Okay, so uh, well, the um, the concept of democracy to begin with uh, is uh, represents a very complex and uh, dynamic uh, reality. That's what makes it so difficult to study. Probably one of the most complex, uh, probably one of the most complex uh, concepts within the vocabulary of social sciences. Uh, because it encompasses lots of realities, lots of uh, issues, and also because when we talk about democracy, there is an a ideological side um, that um, enters in this discussion. So what I've I, what I've tried to do, and lots of academics, uh, which I who I follow, actually try to do, is actually to try to look at it at a more distant, less ideological perspective. Um, even though this is this entails high this entails high risks because as you know well and and since as uh, Professor Didem presented me I'm a social constructivist which means that I really I, I I pay a lot of attention to the meanings that agents and individuals and communities attribute to the reality so uh, one thing that I would like to begin with uh, by saying is that the uh, the, the concept of democracy is a really complex one because of several issues, but also because of the perceptions of the way that people want to be uh, governed or ruled uh, or organized, uh, uh, politically organized. So, as you know, the states, states are political forms of organization. Uh, People in general, communities uh, decided to organize uh, lots of them, not all of them, but lots of the communities decided to organize themselves in the forms of states. And in order to work, uh, those communities uh, chose at a certain point in their history, um, democracy as a way of managing the relationship between the ones that rule and the ones that are ruled. So this is the idea. Dear Andre, so sorry yes. for interrupting you. Yes. Yeah, maybe your microphone is oh. giving us some sounds. That sorry, sorry. Make it a bit is difficult it for us. Yes, I'm sorry. Is it better like this? We are still hearing it. I, I don't know why. Maybe it's because of some connection. The cable. Uh, okay, so let me try to let me try to switch it. Um, just a moment, please. Let me see if I can change Thank here you. the origin of the sound. Is it because of uh, it's okay. like a black and white TV? Yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and now, how is it? It's much better. Thank you. Is so it? Much. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, is it better right now? Okay, yes. good, good. Because I was with my earphones, but the the sound was being uh, used from the web camera, and, and that's probably one of the reasons. So I'm sorry. So as I was saying, um, well, previously just thanking Professor Ditem and then presenting the concept of, of democracy, basically in a nutshell, in ten seconds. So um, the concept of democracy, well. I was saying that democracy is a very complex concept. Um, I don't think it's something that's going to be uh, solved academically uh, with a consensual definition or something, because as I told you, well, uh, communities decided to organize themselves in the form of states and states uh, as a set of institutions needed to define how the rulers and the ruled ones would um, uh, uh, interact with each other. And how should we do that? There's no clear, no obvious answer. So if you look, for example, at the presidentialist system uh, in the United States or the parliamentarian system in the UK, or even the semi-presidentialist system in Portugal, you look at three different ways of organizing the 
political or the governance system. Um, and the three ways are democratic uh, per se, but they, they entail very different relationship between the, the ones who vote. There are, as you know, there are more direct or less direct ways of democracy in terms of referenda, political participation, civil society, uh, the, the, the roles and the powers of different institutions like a president, for example, or a monarch or, and the lack of power um, and the, the, the, the, the the, the assemblies and so on and so forth. So this is, I would say, my basic uh, the background about democracy. Everything that I'm going to present to you uh, today um, is not uh, fixed or absolute right, or it's not, uh, let, let's say, it's not written in the stone. It's just, uh, just a couple of thoughts about how we can look at um, democracy and a, a dimension that may interest us a little bit more, which is the international promotion of democracy, which raises lots of ethical questions considering um, should we do that, basically? Uh, um, is any state entitled to try to, to show or to sell or to force any other state to adopt that vision of a political system? Uh, either you call it democracy or not, uh, because as you know, um, is very, it is very difficult for us to, to find universal global values uh, because we are very different from each other. Each community has uh, its features, its identities, its perceptions, and um, we don't want, uh, well, I don't want at least to, to consider this kind of um, superiority, uh, Western superiority over, the, over, over other communities because they're just different ways of managing politics. So this is my, my background and things that we should keep in mind when we are discussing, when, when we are talking about uh, democracy. Uh, there are therefore several different proposals to conceive, to understand. If you look at a more quantitative dimension to operationalize the concept of democracy, um, which makes any attempt to embrace it a very difficult task. And if you join democracy, quality of democracy, the European Union and Turkey, I think that you find the perfect triangle for disaster, I would say, uh, because there are lots of, well, there, we are talking about three uh, major themes, well, in international relations, in political science, which are uh, particularly um, complex uh, because of several uh, situations, as you know. So it is a very contested concept. Um, and, uh, but the spread of democracy alongside with the studies of democracy have been a reality, mainly since the 19th century. If you look at Samuel Huntington's, for example, in 1991, he divides this democratization of the world into three different and widely referenced uh, and very uh, famous waves of democratization. Um, uh, mainly after the two world wars, uh, both triggered by unstable democracies and susceptible social situations, democracy started to be perceived as the only regime that seemed to work since both fascism and communism failed uh, and the longest established democracies showed relatively success in providing their citizens with the conditions for them to fulfill their, their needs and wishes. Because by the end of the day, that's what I would say that's what uh, marks or characterizes democracy. The idea is that the sovereignty lies in the people, demos kratos, the power to the people. And it means that if we as individuals and as a group are the ones who are entitled with actual power, so we should choose our political um, uh, uh, um, our political representatives or our choices, even if, if it is uh, direct practices of democracy. So the idea, and that's why I like democracy studies so much, is because we are talking about a respect for human dignity and a respect for individuals' uh, opinions and perceptions and visions. As a Democrat, for example, when we look at a result of a referendum, 
even if it doesn't meet what we consider to be the cleverest, the most, the wisest decision, uh, the most strategic one, because we may belong to an elite who may think different from the masses, for example, it really doesn't matter because even if you belong to an elite or the masses or whatever, I mean, all uh, each one of us has his or her own position in the, the the, in, in governing the society, the community. And that's exactly what I think that it's more, more, more uh, important uh, about a democracy. Um, well, but democracy diffusion uh, became part of a broader process of exchange between cultures of models uh, and products of different kinds in a globalized uh, world. Because um, due to globalization, the world uh, uh, exported or countries exported and, and exchanged not only goods, not only uh, products, not only um, restaurant chains, but also ideas, uh, but also ways of doing things. So you visit Turkey, you see how Turkey works at a political level, you learn some things and you bring them home. You visit Portugal, the UK, uh, South Africa, and you see here, people may have a vote or a say about this or that in this way. So globalization, um, this global village brings not only the exchange of products, materially speaking, but also of ideas. We host, uh, fortunately, several Turkish students here at Portugal University in exchange uh, programs, Erasmus programs, and also professors, and we go to Turkey as well. That's exchanging these views about political um, aspects of, of governance, of ruling, and um, actually maturing these ideas of how different things could be. Uh, in, better uh, in, in another in, in a certain way. So um, if we're talking about democratization, for example, uh, it means that d democracy exerts some type of appeal that justifies some population's fights to achieve uh, democracy, to install democracy, to consolidate democracy in their own countries. Um, and so I would say, to, to begin with, that democracy can be defined by what it is not, an autocracy, right? Uh, so to, to keep things uh, clean in the, in the beginning, at least. So if you look at this, uh, this scheme, this political continuum that I have in, in, in my book and that I, I keep using because I think it's really, really visual, uh, and we talk about this logic that traces a political continuum in which one of the extremes is democracy and the other is an autocratic regime. Uh, this is just for pedagogical um, uh, purposes, okay? Because reality is never anything like that, uh, fortunately for some reasons and unfortunately for, for others. Um, throughout this line, we can put different political systems uh, that are defined by their democratization decree. And so any non-democratic regime could be understood as a form of governance that denying their citizens the possibility of political participation has, a prior has as priority the state's interests, exercising the power arbitrarily as Gianfranco Paschino wrote uh, at this uh, very famous political science uh, that you know. So, however, in, inside this wider group, it is possible to find more specific political systems, such as many forms of authoritarianism, totalitarianism, post-totalitarianism, sultanates, many hybrid uh, democracies, semi-democracies. There are lots of names that academics have been giving uh, to these uh, options. However, if an undemocratic regime is established, some changes have to occur in order to modify that situation so that the country enters in a transition period that might eventually lead it to democracy. Uh, yet, as we know, this change is not easy because it has to overcome the obstacles of the resistance of previous regimes, for example, such as economic success, which is a very uh, convincing argument for a, a regime, either a democratic or autocratic regime. If we are doing well, economically speaking, why changing? 
while risking something different that may bring poverty to some or less wealth, for example. The repressive logic or the power of the leaders, for example, uh, they may exert such an, an ambiance that uh, makes people less prone to opt for another political regime. Okay, uh, I would say that if, well, I would say that ideally people have the a respect for the general will, and so the political systems may vary a lot, as you as you know. However, sooner or later, some internal and external dynamics begin to come up and to promote a more or less favorable context to transition. Um, and this movement becomes of utmost importance since institution and the quality of the future democracy depend on the development of this phase. Um, so we have, as, uh, uh, sorry, as you can see here, democratization, as a concept that includes these three phases, liberalization, transition, and consolidation. So the idea is that you, we are moving from the autocratic regime towards a democratic uh, regime, and all of that, we can call it democratization. What is liberalization? Liberalization means opening up the, um, the regime. There are some changes, some measures that open the regime. There are what we call the preconditions for transition, a preparation for transition. And this preparation can be led by agents, uh, the structure, some, uh, some particular conditions. And we can look both at civil society as, as, a, as a fundamental uh, uh, actor and also elites because elites can hamper or make it harder for a, a, a regime to change or help it, or even, even civil society as well. So there are lots of studies about the impact and the importance of elites and the masses uh, in terms of uh, promoting democracy and transition. On the other hand, we have structure. Uh, on this side, we have uh, variables such as economic development, social, civil, and psychological prerequisites like political culture. Does this community know what a democracy is? Do they have a collective memory of what it means? And do they want to come back to that? Or is it completely new? On the other side, we have history. We have the features, uh, more or less repressive features of the regime that is installed. And something that uh, is uh, pushing me towards uh, today's uh, major focus, which is in the international environment. Are there agents trying to promote democratic transition? How are they doing it? By force, like the US usually does, by normative power as the EU uh, wants to do, sometimes more successfully than others, uh, just by example, just by inspiring at, and so on and so forth. So, um, and my focus will be precisely this, this, uh, this international environment, international organizations, international promotion of democracy. Um, uh, and well, and that's a, precisely my focus. Then we have transition. Transition is just, according to, uh, I, I'd like to underline this, according to my definition, okay, not most definitions, my definitions, for me, transition is a very short period in time in which we have a factual uh, change in the regime. So if you have a coup d'etat, if you have a revolution, or if you have a change of regime, and then you make a new constitution, and a new government is elected, transition ends there. Uh, but you may ask, but Professor, uh, does that mean that you elect a democratically elected government and you are a democracy of a sudden after decades of uh, authoritarianism, for example? No, we enter the consolidation uh, phase. Consolidation phase, um, following this rationale that I'm presenting to you, means this complete institutionalization, and I'm quoting, you can read from Friedman and Haag uh, work, uh, institutionalization of a new system, the adoption of its rules and procedures and the spread of democratic values. 
as we all know as social scientists, mimicking institutions, imitating institutions is very easy and straightforward. You want a, an assembly, you want a parliament, you want a president, you want a courts, you want a government, it's really easy to build, right? You just create the rules, you create institutions. What is difficult is that individuals, the community understands the rules, that the community plays by the rules. I always give this very interesting example, and I say interesting example for a very Western Portuguese vision of democracy and of political system, because as, we, as, you, as you may know, we had a, a, a revolution in 74, uh, and ever since we've been a democracy, we usually perform well, uh, lots of sh shortcomings, of course, and, and problems that all the systems have, but I would say, I would say that a generally well uh, uh, democratic performance, uh, topping uh, ranking in top 10 or top 20 of international organizations rankings, uh, just, just to, to, to, to framework um, this, this condition. But for example, in Afghanistan, the, in some, uh, some periods, in some contexts, imagine um, the occurrence of elections. Okay, elections are easy to, to assemble. Elections are easy to hold. Look at Syrian uh, examples. I was talking about that this morning. 95% of, of Syrians voted for Assad, which means uh, that, well, elections were there. Uh, so elections are easy to, to, to, to organize. The problem is all the other things that we know that make those elections or that procedure just a, a, a, an empty reality, an empty concept that is, that is kind of a, a lack of adjustment uh, between uh, the concept and its true meaning, what it was supposed to do, uh, which is to represent a popular will. And when, for example, President Bashar al-Assad uh, uh, just allows the occurrence of elections in government control zones, well, this is kind of a deviation from democracy because not everyone is entitled to participate. Uh, just people who uh, President al-Assad wants to participate. So you see, so this is kind of a, a disconnection. We have elections, formally speaking, okay, but we do not have the real meaning and participation and respect for what people really want. And that's why I, I, uh, I, I defend that, I stand for this idea of consolidation uh, as a very long period. It's not only the mimicking institutions, but also internalizing those rules, those values, the values, the meaning of democracy, saying that if I want to give my opinion about something, I may give it uh, without fear. And I was talking about uh, uh, Afghanistan, and just to complete this, this example, okay, elections uh, were held, but the, the, the head of the family, the father, uh, asked people in, in, the, in, in, um, in the electoral polls to give him the uh, voting sheets for the, his entire family. He wanted to cast not only his individual vote, but also his family's votes. What is this? Well, this is precisely the phase of consolidations. There are elections, we are not discussing if they are valid, free and fair. Okay, it's another issue. But there are a, an individual uh, that grew in a certain environment that makes him believe that he's entitled to choose for other people. Okay, And I'm not criticizing this. Uh, I would like to underline that. Uh, I'm just saying that this is a an internal adaptation of an external promotion. How fair, how reasonable, how wise that is, it's kind of a, an ethical issue that we can discuss, of course, but uh, which is another step. So backing to the, the theoretical dimension. So consolidation is very complex, is very lengthy, is very uncertain. It doesn't always mean progress, progress, 
Okay, it does not mean that you make your transition now and in 10 years you will be a super democracy fulfilling all the criteria and respecting gender equality, respect for min minorities, human rights, political participation and so on and so forth. There are several steps that are uh, taken. I, I always use Andreas Schädler's uh, model. This is a 1990s uh, something model, but I think it's really interesting because Andreas Schädler, um, different from other authors, understands that consolidation, consolidation may entail positive or negative movements, meaning that so if you look at, at, at this uh, uh, scheme here, so we have autocratic regimes and we have what we call the zero moment of democracy elections. If you have elections, you are formally speaking, entering the democratic regime, but it's very different if you only hold, uh, hold elections free and fair, more free and more or less free and more or less fair, or if you respect lots of other criteria that puts you in this theoretically created advanced perfect democracy. So we have led lots of steps of stages of phases. And uh, uh, Andreas Schädler created this, uh, this scheme that I usually, it's from 1998, but I think it's really clever. Look, we are, uh, uh, democratic consolidation does not always mean completing democracy or deepening democracy. It may mean that you have a liberal democracy, but you backslide to an electoral democracy. In this year, 2021, we have more autocracies in the world than democracies. 52% of the world population, according to several international organizations, live in autocratic regimes. And this is a novelty uh, because the last time that this happened was in 2001, two decades ago. So it means that, look, we have certain waves, democratization waves, autocratization waves, and we need to look at this. We can discuss this, this it further. It's not the, really the focus of my presentation today, but the reasons behind this. And I think this is more serious than having lots of lunatics or uh, kind of weird political leaders uh, uh, spread throughout the world. It's, it's more serious than that. Uh, it, we are talking about people that do, do not feel identified with this political organization. They don't trust politicians, so that's why they elected a clown in Brazil for the assembly, for the Senate. And this is true, uh, this is not a metaphor. Uh, he, uh, the, uh, Tiririca was his name, and he presented himself dressed and professionally as a clown, and he was elected. And this, it, even though this is not a metaphor, this is real, this happened, this happened, uh, we need to understand the message behind this. In Brazil as well, uh, gangsters and criminals were elected for public offices. It means that people are uh, trying other alternatives. I mean, serious politicians did not solve the, uh, my problem. So why not try some things uh, some different things. What happened in 1933 in Germany was just that. I'm starving. Uh, this republic hasn't solved my problems. I can't earn enough money to provide for my family. So this guy here says that he's going to solve things. Now we have a more complex situation because we have uh, access to lots of information, social media, and so on and so forth. We are way more informed, but at the same time, less informed because of this information and propaganda and so on and so forth. So things are much more complex now. So why are people disconnected from de democratic regimes? Why are people letting that autocratic leaders pave their way? So, and I think that 
we as academics, as um, uh, uh, in, in, in, in academy, students, uh, everyone, the civil society in general, should think about this. What is the solution? Uh, is to bring uh, people closer to decision-making process? But do uh, individuals want to be every day? Because as you know, this is this, there is this, um, uh, um, this enthusiasm with e-democracy, electoral democracy. Electoral democracy, not in the sense of casting an electronic vote, which is something that's really easy, but is that, that you have a, an, an app on your an app on your phone and you choose to vote for or against, or against a, a bill, a, a proposal of law, for example. So would this solve the democratic crisis, for example? We don't know. I know for sure that that would create some issues. First, a gap between those who have access to information, to apps, to smartphones, to uh, uh, education, and those who don't, who would keep away, uh, would be kept from uh, access to political decision making as well. They would not be represented because this is kind of the agora, the Greek. Uh, a practice of direct democracy in, in, in today's uh, mechanisms and technologies. There are lots of suggestions that have been made, but my question is, do we as individuals want to uh, come home in the evening tired, sometimes not really happy, sometimes happier, and look at your phone and see what do I think about this bill to improve budget for uh, public electricity. Um, is it fair to demand that from people? Would that bring people closer to political decision making? Yes, directly speaking. But do people have this responsibility or did we create the representative system in a way to, uh, uh, to, to, to avoid this uh, more concrete decision making because we have other issues to solve in our lives because we are not politicians and we are not professionals we have lots of other things to consider okay um, and about what about technical issues am i uh, competent enough to decide matters of foreign policy or uh, public spending or uh, chemical uh, chemical products for agriculture for example uh, so lots of things uh, uh, come uh, to this to this question. So I would I, I won't uh, uh, explain all of this in detail. Um, you can read it in in my my book or in my thesis. Uh, I can give you access to it if you want. I can I can send it to Professor Didem to share it with you. And um, I, I'm not going into uh, much detail about the personalization of the concept, which is something that's really. Uh, theoretical, methodological, but it's not really the focus. Uh, I wanted just uh, to talk also about international promotion of democracy, raise some questions more than give you the answers, uh, because actually I think that usually that's my, my role to raise the questions uh, rather than the answers. Um, so international promotion of democracy uh, was a forgotten variable for lots of time. Uh, people only looked within the political system. So how can we promote or consolidate democracy? And they looked within the borders of a political system. Then we shifted and uh, democracy promotion became a fashionable international art. Uh, several actors involved different approaches, different agendas, different objectives, different reasons and motives. And this internal external debate was reduced at a certain moment to just only what comes from abroad matters, which is exactly the opposite the dynamic. Nowadays, we, we refuse, and I mean academia in general, refuse a zero sum uh, solution for this. We just say, what we call, what Magan and Merlino called a, a democratic anchoring. So this is a, a way of saying that 
democratization is an internal process with external influences. So it's not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, uh, the winner takes all, right? It's not only the internal or, or all the external, because external influences are interpreted by the local communities and, and the national realities. But the national realities cannot also ignore what's going around them. So I think that is, this is a very clever way to solve this, saying that we have an interaction. The focus now is to understand how much of these variables influence uh, the uh, democratization process. And that's why we have lots of studies and uh, a very extensive literature on this. But how do international actors promote uh, democracy? Several uh, ways, several patterns. I would uh, divide them into what we see here in this left side, what we call uh, for, uh, material mechanisms, ideational mechanisms. We have hard power as a mechanism of external democracy proposal, uh, promotion. You know so several examples. Look at Iraq, for example. What the US did was a direct intervention to promote democracy. Of course, we can discuss this, the, the reasons, the reasons behind it. Um, and, but we can also have indirect interventions. We can have uh, states or international organizations funding, uh, training, and doing other uh, strategies to indirectly force democratization. We also have conditionality, which is European Union's uh, preferred way, the carrot and stick policy. Turkey knows that very well. All the candidate countries know that very well, and even member states know that very well. If you don't reach set search a certain outcome, you will be punished or you will be rewarded if you do. So that's, we have the negative and positive political conditionality, meaning that if you do not respect minority rights, I will not pursue with you favorable, more favorable uh, trade conditions, for example. Or if you do not uh, fulfill with certain conditions, you will not uh, proceed with the uh, candidacy uh, um, uh, process, enlargement process. On the other hand, we have ideational aspects. Uh, the sun is hitting my window, so I think that I have kind of a Nora right now. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I think I, I can't solve this very well right now, but okay, I can do this. Okay, so, um, is, is, is the sun of knowledge and democracy promotion shining in Porto. So, uh, as I was saying, ideational aspects, such as socialization and emulation. There are other ways of promoting democracy. For example, Erasmus program. Erasmus, Erasmus program is a socialization uh, strategy. Uh, students uh, live in one country, study in, in, in another they see democracy working or not working and they, and they bring with them some ideas, some expectations. And youngsters are the future decision makers, the voters, the, the influential civil society. Uh, and we have other strategies uh, like that. We also have uh, emulation. Emulation means uh, contagion or convergence. It, it, it is a, a uh, more active or, or a more, more spontaneous uh, or more intentional process. For example, you are surrounded by uh, political systems that understand that, semi that apply, for example, semi-presidentialism. You start looking you see that's a more complex system, but it may work. And then uh, uh, you emulate that example. You are not forced. You, are, you, do not even, you don't even have incentives. You just look at the other example and you start thinking, would that work for me? 
many critics uh, of international promotion of democracy say that this is not promotion of democracy. This is an internal adaptation. It's just looking abroad and seeing other examples, say that may work here. And this is considered as, I don't like to say natural because I'm a constructivist, so it's nothing about nature here, but is about, let's say, a, a, a more genuine in the sense of um, is saying that no one forced me to accept their vision of democracy. Uh, and also, and also, uh, you can compare it, for example, you can compare it with uh, hard power and direct intervention, which is exactly the opposite. Why did democracy promotion fail in Iraq? Because Western-like democracies were not built upon these sociological, anthropological structures that are present in Iraq. So this idea of uh, taking a political system and just moving it without asking, just saying, I know that this will be better for you. This is kind of a more paternalistic approach. It's like what we do to our children, right? We say, we know better, we know better. Actually, parents do because we are older than the children and more experienced, I would say. But this does not apply between equal states, sovereign states, I would say, because uh, states not only have uh, equal sovereignty, but they also have very different, very different experiences and visions about reality. Uh, anthropological organizations, uh, tribes, for example, hierarchical structures, that should be respected. Uh, and some democratic models being exported like the US did in Iraq, for example, does not respect that reality. So this is something that's uh, like forced. And this is, well, m basically the, the, the opposition between the, the difference between material and, and um, ideational, ideational aspects of, uh, um, uh, of, of democracy promotion. Um, so I do not, I don't know how much time I do have, Didem, I'm sorry, because I usually will um, distract or if I have over exceeded it. You know, Andre, it's already, I think, 10 p.m. here. So it's mm -hmm. been one hour. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's really up to you if you wish to continue a little bit. We, we are happy to listen. Okay, so I, I will, uh, okay, so I will wrap up. I will wrap up well in, in one minute, uh, just just not to, to leave things uh, like this. And then I'm free to, to, to listen and to uh, answer to all your questions and comments uh, because your reality is really different from mine. So your perception is necessarily different from mine. And that's what makes this so interesting. So, uh, so the idea of international promotion of democracy uh, has um, I would say, and just uh, coming to this, uh, well, to uh, <clears throat> just this, uh, this uh, final scheme here, uh, each international actor has its own agenda. The reasons to promote democracy, some may be more genuine in terms of promoting real democracy. I mean, I, wa I genuinely want other uh, communities to feel respected some others may have other interests. Russia promotes its own form of political governance, which is very different from Western liberal democracies, as you know. So democracy promotion by Russia is not exactly the same as by, by Sweden, the Nordic countries, which, who, which try to export social liberalization. Japan, economic liberalization. United States, political liberalization, a very top-down approach, sometimes coercively using military means. Then we have international organizations such as the European Union, the Council of Europe, um, United Nations, World Bank, all of them, and even NATO, all of them have strategies to promote democracy or to promote their vision of democracy, which raises ethical issues depending on where are they promoting it and how are they promoting it. So we have lots of, um, lots of, uh, uh, I would say advantages and positive side of international promotion of democracy, 
uh, such as trying to extend, and I would, I would say that that is genuinely uh, a, a very good thing, that you try to show other communities, look, we do like that, we do like this, and we feel respected and valued and heard. So if you want to do the same, this works like this. On the other, on the other hand, we have other strategies that may create social friction, that may create polarization. Uh, you know in Turkey that uh, Turkish society uh, is characterized by a very particular reality. Any political system that is um, in place or that would be in place or will be in place or this is uh, uh, progressing needs to take into consideration Turkey's uh, past. And by Turkish past, I mean Tanzimat, I mean the Turkish Republic, I mean your uh, sociological approaches, your religions, your views, your geostrategic position, because you're surrounded by a myriad of very interesting case studies for international relations, but which are not exactly the most successful democracies or the most stable scenarios. Um, and therefore, we cannot just think that securitization issues in Turkey are, are exactly the same as in Portugal, for example. For Portuguese people, fortunately, as you may imagine, Syria is not an issue, right? Russia is not an issue. Uh, Iran is not an issue. Saudi Arabia, mo many Portuguese people would not even know that the country exists, in, you see? So we cannot compare securitization needs or perceptions about, for example, the role of the military in Portugal and in Turkey. And when we talk about democracy promotion, uh, that happened, and I will conclude with this, that happened with um, Turkish accession to the European Union, the redefinition of uh, uh, uh, civil military relations, for example. The European Union demanded Turkey to follow Western patterns of civil military relations without taking into consideration that the military has played for centuries a very different role in Turkey, in the Ottoman Empire and Turkey. Very different from what happened in Portugal, Spain, um, France, uh, Italy, for example. So these things should be taken into consideration. So there are these theoretical models and then we should, well, choose and look at very uh, specific case studies uh, and I will wrap, uh, wrap up like this. Thank you for listening uh, and to be and to pay attention to this discourse. And well, I'm I'm more than available to reply to your questions and comments. And thank you very much, um, all of you. Yeah, Andre, thank you so much for this inspiring speech. I took so many notes, <laughs> but I don't want to abuse my position. Maybe I should just ask a, a, you know my short question first, so that. Uh, my students and my colleagues are also think about their own questions. Uh, my question will be about Viktor Orban. <laughs> so okay. he was talking about liberal authoritarianism. If, mm -hmm. if you are listening to his speeches, mm -hmm. emphasizing that liberal democracy is becoming, um, is trying to impose itself on Hungary and other countries with this communist legacy. So do you think that they will be able to consolidate their democracy and become part of the core Europe at the end? Or will they accelerate European democratic backsliding? And when I look at the global strategy of the EU, I see that they are talking about resilience and principled pragmatism, which is interpreted by some analysts as the EU's will to protect what its values rather than promote them in the international arena. So I was really curious about your position and opinions mm -hmm. on this. Yes, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for beginning with a, an easy one. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Didem. Yes, uh, Hungary and Poland are very, um, very, I would say, tricky cases uh, within the European Union. So uh, several things about those issues. First, Hungary is the first non-democratic 
regime, and I mean evaluated by international organizations, uh, organizations as such, within the European Union. So I think that, yes, the European Union should pay more attention right now in this moment within its borders, because as a normative power, that would be completely hypocritical uh, by, by the European Union to say, well, democracy is the best model that there is. And then, except for Hungary, which they have their own system, uh, right? Uh, so first, the European Union wants to, well, I'm, I'm a, a neuro enthusiast. Uh, <laughs> I, I really like the European Union and I'm really glad that we are within the EU. Uh, so. But, I, but I'm a, a, a very critical uh, for several reasons. And the European Union has a, a global actor agenda and narrative. And I understand it should have, uh, because otherwise it just become irrelevant. Um, just uh, uh, inside brackets, this morning about Syria, the European Union has not been mentioned once by any of the academics. So, so, so, so that you can assess that we were like say six academics talking about issues. We have an audience of like 50 people asking questions. And my final remark about the event was precisely this. We've talked about Canada, Australia. We talked about Turkey, obviously, uh, Russia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, the United States, Brazil, China, but never about European Union. Uh, so, the European Union, in terms of democracy, I think that it should look inwards uh, within its boundaries and then just try to uh, progressively, because as a normative power, that's all the European Union has. So the European Union has lost the only effect that it had, so which is kind of uh, sad uh, from my perspective. So yes, on the other hand, we should look at, at Hungary as uh, with, uh, within this broader wave of autocratization. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's not a, a single case. Unfortunately, the whole world is full of uh, uh, liberal, illiberal hybrid, whatever you want to call them. They are not real democracies. And when I say real democracies, I say that people's wishes are not respected, that there is an environment of self-censorship, for example, which is, not, which is something much less obvious than like, let's say 50 years ago, 15 years ago, you would have censorship or no censorship. Now we have disinformation, you have fake news, and you have the, the, the, the blockage of, of social media, which you in Turkey know very well of. Um, so, these are different strategies, not very, it's not so typical, not so, um, uh, well, recent, and we need to deal with that. So I would say that Hungary is within this wave for the same reasons others are. And more importantly, the European Union needs to really try to, try to understand what is happening in Hungary to prevent it from happening in the rest of the European Union. And, and trying to support Hungary as well, but at the same time, I would say that the European Union should be harsher on, on, on, on Hungary uh, because the idea is that, and I'm not, uh, I don't think that European Union is, is, is like of a neo-colonialist uh, empire or project. I just say that we are a voluntary international organization. So if you want to stay within, you should embrace our values because otherwise, otherwise it doesn't make sense. And that's why I was so happy about uh, uh, Brexit, uh, because you either embrace what we believe in or you don't, we do not need to be enemies, but you don't need to be within because you're just creating uh, havoc, chaos, uh, which is not, which just doesn't make sense. I, uh, I, uh, Europeans have not created the European Union to accept different visions, let's say, um, uh, dictatorships. And then what is the opinion is nothing, right? So looking inwards first, trying to understand what's happening, what is uh, disintegrating or uh, this lack of identification with democratic standards. I mean, I, we know the, the historical past of Hungary, but we also know that Hungary is part of the European Union since 2004. So almost, almost two decades uh, afterwards, Hungary is looking at alternatives 
This is very serious uh, because Hungary is no different, is no more, no less than Slovenia, than Slovakia, than Portugal, than Spain. We never know what may happen, right? So looking inwards, trying to understand the reasons being harsher on Hungary to prevent other uh, uh, copycats and imitators. And then, yes, saying that we try to promote democracy and human rights. That's our voice, uh, but without double standards, which is, other, uh, prob which is another problem uh, of, of the European Union. And you in Turkey know that very well because um, the European Union has been many times unfair to Turkey for this lack of coherency and for double standards. Uh, and this cannot happen. This cannot happen, uh, not with uh, Turkey, nor with anyone else, because the thing is like, again, parenthood. If you, say, if you say to your child that he or she can't do something, but you are doing it, it, it you lose your authority, your legitimacy. You will never, you, you won't ever be respected. That's, a, that's exactly the same. And I'm almost quoting Alexander Zvent, anthropological, uh, anthropomorphic uh, characteristic of the states, right? Like states are like, like people. You cannot have, um, uh, well, I'm not mentioning the sofa gate, uh, which was kind of a very interesting um, diplomatic uh, moment, uh, but you cannot have um, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen saying that democracy is the best option for every one of us, and then having and Hungary saying that maybe it is not, uh, right? Because she's representing everyone, including Hungarians, who do not believe that democracy as it is may be the best uh, option right now. Thank you so much, Andre. And it is very really ironic and paradoxical that Hungary is not withdrawing from the EU. It yeah. prefers to remain within. This is also paradoxical. Yes, because, because there are lots of uh, there's there's a lot of uh, incoherences in in um, in, in these uh, populist uh, uh, discourses. You know, I mean, we don't want uh, the European Union, but we don't want to leave. But we want European Union funding and and the voice that it gives us uh, internationally speaking, but we are not accepting its own values. So this is a lot of incoherence. Uh, and I, th I think that's, uh, that's a mark of uh, authoritarianisms and populisms in general, because they just say what people want to listen, even if it doesn't make sense. We have to respect certain uh, ideological uh, preferences as being coherent, right? Let's say communism. Communism, either you like it or not, is very coherent. You may feel identified with the ideology or not. Liberalism, the same. Many other ideological options. You can like them or not, but you cannot accuse them of being incoherent because they are not. They are coherent. Uh, but populisms and demagogy and dictators, they do not have a rationale, a philosophical background. They are like, uh, let's say, um, they, they, they seize the opportunities. Say, is, so you're afraid of unemployment, so un employment is what you get. You are afraid of refugees, so protecting against the refugees is what you get. You like the European Union, so we are, we are in. So you don't like it, we are out. If you like NATO, we are in, and so on and so forth. And this is not coherent. This is just opportunistic. It's just they're seizing the opportunity just to, to be popular. Uh, and, and, and that's exactly what, what's happening there, uh, including with their belonging to the European Union, because you've never heard any Hungarian um, threatening leaving the European Union because they do not have the negotiation power the UK has. So it would be very costly for Hungary to leave the European Union. Uh, they would leave it proudly, but uh, things wouldn't go well for them. Thank you so much, Andre. Um, and they are also very inconsistent towards globalization. They are not mm -hmm. always anti globalists. I see that. They are sometimes trying to establish a global alliance of anti-immigration, for example. So yes. they're also globalists in a sense, yes. yes. globalizers. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any questions? So the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. 
Mind if I start? Of course. My colleague Evren uh, is going. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Andrea. It's, it was nice to see you and listen to your presentation. Many thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> slightly off on the tangent, a uh, question I have, uh, because during your presentation, you also mentioned about the issue of probably trust. Uh, because uh, voters, and actually, the rate of turnouts, democratic turnout rates, begin to diminish. And you also mentioned about the rise of or re-rise of uh, authoritarian attitudes. Uh, the last time we said it, the last time we saw uh, such a problem all around the world, uh, if I didn't get it wrong, you said it was 2001, right? Yeah. Uh, so what happened that turned the tide uh, from democracy towards authoritarianism? This is the simple question, I guess. The other part, it's a more, uh, a rather more uh, constructivist question, <laughs> as, as you may imagine, as I imagine you might like it. Because... Uh, in 2010, I was a student in the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. And as part of a uh, homework, I asked several people about, um, about the parties they vote for, about the parties, political parties they, uh, they believe. And the answers I get was, re was really interesting because almost none of them was really trusting or believing in their role, the party's role. And I sensed a real dissociation between the parties, between the political parties and the voters. And then in 10 years time, now I see such kind of dissociation between the voters and the parties all around the world and the rise of, hence the rise of populism. But I can expand the issue of dissociation. It was, it's not just about uh, the issue of trust uh, towards uh, political structures, but also people start to uh, display uh, science and scientists, uh, the corporations, I mean, many things. Because uh, this is why I think that modernity as a whole, the institutions of modernity as a whole, rather than democracy itself, are being put into question. People are dissociating themselves with the institutions modernity gave them and promised them. So I sense a, a general kind of dissociation. It's, I don't think that it's just democracy. Uh, so hence the re rise of populism. So I just wonder what do you think? And lastly, it's not a question, sorry. Uh, lastly, uh, we might start a project about this in the short run. And I would be glad if you can be a bit part of it and Portugal and through Portugal and you can participate in our project as well. So uh, sorry for the long commentful uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I'd be more than, than glad to participate uh, and to, to work with you on, on these issues, which really uh, interests me. I mean, this is my hot topic. This, uh, um, Democracy and Turkey, uh, not necessarily associated, uh, but also uh, are actually my, my, my preferred uh, topics and IR theories as well. So thank mm. you. Uh, uh, so you don't have to apologize because there's no uh, fast or easy way to ask these questions, uh, which are actually the $1 million questions. Um, what is happening that what your comments uh, um, are, point to this, what is happening? Um, 
And I would say that you've touched several uh, possible explanations. Uh, and the thing, and this is so complex because we cannot use, uh, well, a, a simple causal effect saying mm. like A caused this. Unfortunately, mm. it would be much easier to identify and to solve. So there are sets of, of lots of questions. And you mentioned a lot of them, uh, like dissociation, lack of identification, access of information, access of information. Because we know what political parties do right now. 30 years ago, people voted for a party just because, well, for, uh, I'd say, like uh, the charisma of the leader, for ideological purposes. I'm a worker. I vote for a, a, a worker party. Uh, I'm entrepreneur. I vote for a liberal party. It mm -hmm. would be as simple as that. But now people start to question. Uh, to be uh, um, electoral behavior is much more volatile these days. I mm. vote for a left party right now, tomorrow a right wing party, and afterwards a center party, which makes it a lot uh, much more unpredictable. My grandmother, for example, she always says that she has voted in the very same party in all the elections uh, mm. that she has participated in. Uh, she's 85 years old. So as you can imagine, she has lived much of her life within the dictatorship in Portugal, which just uh, ended in 74. So mm. you see that this learning process, so she will vote in the very same uh, party forever. But you know that her um, children and grandchildren do not think like that. We were born, I was born uh, in, in democracy. I know that we, may, we pay attention, we look at the proposals and we can choose. Uh, so this, is very, this means that we have access to information, which, which means that we are more, much more demanding. It, we are not just so blind as, I mean, I see what political parties are doing. I've just seen that they have blocked a bill a proposal that uh, would, let's say, uh, um, block the possibility of, of corruption within political parties, for example, right? I mean, I saw that uh, this resonates uh, in me. But we also have, well, this would be simple, okay? People have information, good, they will decide and they will be more informed. But we have disinformation at the same time and fake news. And so uh, when you mention the scientists, for example, when you say when, when we say institutions and I'm institutions, I mean, uh, political institutions, scientists, civil society organizations, at a certain moment, you know, you don't know where to turn because, well, I've discovered that this charity organization that I used to support, well, they are marked by corruption. Or I thought that this political, uh, this politician was clean, but we've just now found out that he had some issues in uh, South America. So the thing is that it's lo lots of things. Populism just feeds from this as uh, nat national socialism in uh, Germany in the 30s just uh, was a result from, from the crash of the Wall Street and the hyperinflation uh, crisis in Germany. So Hitler was doing back then very cleverly because um, it, he was very smart in this sense. That's saying, you have problems, I will solve them in my own way. Don't worry, you don't need to worry about that because I have my, my, my strategy. Mm -hmm. So populists are doing exactly the same thing, right? I'm sending back refugees. So I'm solving your issues. You don't have a job, but without refugees, you'll get one, right? So the thing is that, and this, uh, this is kind of uh, all of um, all of these uh, mixtures of uh, it, lots of information. You have access to all the information in the world within your hand when you have your smartphone. But at the same time, uh, a high percentage of that information is fake. Uh, and then you look to political parties or to scientists, and then you you start not trusting them. So the the, the one million dollar question is exactly what what you, what you mentioned that like trust. How can we make trustful institutions, right? Um, and the thing is, I don't think that we can. 
uh, the only possibility is just to reinforce, legally speaking, for example, um, making, let's say, for example, uh, corruption a very uh, sanctionable, uh, very heavy uh, fines and penalties uh, against corruption, for example. The, that's only possibility. You cannot trust in this sense, like human nature. You have to say that, okay, if things go well and the, the person is not corrupt, great. But if he or she is, the system will cor correct it. So I don't trust that person, but I trust the system. That's, that was the hope of many Americans, Northern Americans in relation to Donald Trump. I don't trust that person but I trust in American political institutions to control him somehow. And that's actually worked out. So from my perspective, the more mature institutions are uh, and the, the, the, strongest, the stronger the rules and procedures and checks and balances, I'd say that checks and balances system, the more secure people will feel. Look at American case, for example, and look at other dictators, as you know. Dictators do not have checks. They eliminate them. That's the first step. Well, all of us in political science and international relations know that if we want to become a dictator, the first step is to gather support. The second step is to eliminate possible threats. And then the third moment is just to rule what, however we are, we please, right? So if we do not give that possibility, right? I mean, we have a person we don't trust in as a president or prime minister in Hungary, for example, but that's all right because we will have 300 uh, members of the parliament controlling that uh, possibility. That's all right. So this is kind of a bad, time, a, a bad time that will be replaced in the future. And since we have political cycles in the next four years, then we will correct our mistake when we trusted in that person. Again, the, the United States example is very clear of that. Uh, many people supported Donald Trump, okay? And it's legitimate. Uh, it's their, their legitimate choice. Um, except if the Russians have uh, interfered. Um, but many others have said, oops, I am sorry that I have voted for this person, not anymore. Okay, so this, and also um, we have lots of other things like uh, reinforcing these um, socialization processes. Erasmus program is brilliant for that, it's brilliant. Uh, uh, uh, tourism is very good as well, but academic tourism and Erasmus program is really because you are feeding people with alternatives. They say, well, well it, this doesn't have to be like this. I should be able to say what I think about this issue uh, because there's nothing in nature that would forbid me to do that. And I'm legitimately uh, holding a sovereignty. So you are representing me. I am not a person that you command, right? It's exactly coming back to the Greek uh, original idea of democracy. Uh, we do politics, but we don't, do to, we don't want to do them directly. So we choose you to do that on my, my behalf. That's kind of, if you think about it, it would be kind of an humiliating position, right? I mean, I am your servant, the politician, theoretically speaking, right? You don't want to do politics, I will do them for you. So the, this thing of uh, trust is very important. I would say reinforce institutions from the bottom. Those uh, top-down strategies have failed everywhere, as you know. So bottom up is the solution uh, from my opinion, in my opinion, obviously. But uh, reinforcing the rule of law, checks and balances, all the democratic principles that, all, that are already there. We don't need to make up more concepts and uh, principles. Um, legality of administration, rule of law, um, uh, equality, um, all, the, all the democratic principles, uh, uh, accountability, responsiveness, uh, vertical and horizontal accountability. That's all that is. 
right? And it's vertical accountability with that we cross cut with horizontal inter-institutional uh, balances. And we have a lunatic, but we have other sensitive people surrounding him saying that, I'm sorry, that won't pass. You shall not, you shall not pass. So uh, that I think that obviously this is not a, an answer, unfortunately, because I would run for, for a novel. Uh, but uh, I think that all these variables should be uh, considered. I mean, reinforcing civil yeah. society, uh, reinforcing institutions and, and adapting 19th uh, uh, uh, century institutions to 21st century institutions, uh, which is also very important. How? I don't know, actually, uh, but mm -hmm. adapting mm -hmm. that because they were created in the 19th centuries, um, lots of them. So mm -hmm. probably it's time to think that things may work a little bit, a little slightly, uh, uh, slightly differently. Uh, thank you very much. But uh, to add just one last command, command, command, command maybe, uh, yes, the origin of uh, democracy, the Athenian democracy, but it, the golden age of Athenian democracy, as Socrates and Plato put it, was the era of Pericles. But just after the death of Pericles, who came? Cleon. And Cleon was the first of the demagogues. Mm -hmm. And demagogues, which means the leader of the mobs, leader of mm -hmm. the populace, the people. Yes. However, the way he communicated with people and the, harn the way he harnessed their, their uh, passionate motivations and distrust to towards the established institutions uh, was the beginning of the fall of the Athenian democracy. And more violence ensued. So... Uh, I kind of sense a similar kind of distrust among the people at the same time in the in the Greek democracy in, in Athenian democracy as well. So that's what I yes. feel. That's what I fear, actually. Yes, yes, of course, yes. Uh, I was philosophically speaking, right? The, the concept, the origin, that idea. Uh, yes, but obviously, uh, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> so it seems so, like it's a deinstitutionalization which leads to more populism uh, it, yeah, yeah I, I would say that that a a, a uh, because that's why i'm not a huge fan of these uh, of these uh, new trends of uh, of uh, digitalizing everything uh, mm -hmm. because we've tested um uh, we've tested like app applications uh, programs and involvement of youth i mean i mean the idea that youngsters do not participate in politics because they just care for uh, social media networks uh, and they will they will change their app or they use other apps to participate to, to, to vote in in political legislative bills i mean it's just i think it's just naive uh, using the mobile phone okay it's kind of a very big strategy uh, a, a very important strategy, but well, but it doesn't it, it doesn't match because you need to be motivated and you need to respect people's wishes in the terms that we've established a social contract um, according to Rousseau, right? So the thing is that we created that contract and we said, well, you do that on my behalf. Um, I will vote, I will control, I will participate in some organizations if I want to. I mean, we cannot, I, I, I, uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm just giving my personal opinion on this. I don't think that we should get too um, excited about this idea of forcing people to participate politically. I say every single day we should be paying attention to all bills and all political issues of your country. It's not your responsibility. You should be. You should pay attention. You should read. You should, of course. But that comes from education. It's not something that you will force people to choose. You have to choose. You have to vote. You ha you have to to to write uh, law proposals to take pictures of of your problems of your public electricity and se send them to the city council if you don't want to because it's not your job, right? So there are. Uh, uh, we should think about other ways. Um, I don't know wh which ones, uh, but but other ways. Yeah, thank you so much. And when you said 2001, we know how the story went. So should we expect Biden, who is emphasizing, for example, fight against corruption, 
as a very important part of US foreign policy. Um, will he be a how to say a hawk, hawkish democratizer in the world? Well, by force. Would you predict I'm, something yeah, like that? I, I, I think know it's, it's, it's too early. I think it's too early. Um, uh, Biden has presented like a very different uh, foreign policy for the United States. Uh, but that does not mean that does not necessarily mean uh, being multilateral does not necessarily mean being cooperative for promotion of democracy and human rights means the US being uh, where it needs to be to reinforce its dominant position without uh, before it is too late for the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, for example. Right. It, so I cannot predict them. Uh, well, obviously, I, I, well, it's not that obvious, but I, I can assume it publicly that I I'd rather have a, a Joe Biden rather than Donald Trump. It's my personal political, ideological, whatever you want to call it, view. Uh, but uh, but on that uh, regard, I don't think that either Trump or Biden would be a safe choice if you want to see United States that are really worried, worried about the stability of the international system, the promotion of human rights and democracy, rather than their own interests. Because a more active foreign policy, multilateralism, uh, me, does not necessarily mean that we have to wait and see, wait and see what kind of conditions uh, um, does Biden uh, present for that, the cost of that presence. Uh, that, that will be very interesting to analyze. Yes, and the EU seems to be interested in learning how to speak to illiberals. <laughs> that would be a very good skill in, in, in, uh, uh, um, for, for workers in the EU, right? How to, <laughs> how to talk to them, how to persuade them otherwise, I would say. That, that should be considered in the programs to accept interns right now. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I would say that uh, that's... The EU, um, I'm afraid that the EU is completely lost in, in, this, in these regards, unfortunately. And, um, I, and it saddens me to say that, but I think it is. I think it is um, for several reasons, which has, uh, I think that are more directly related to internal organization. The treaties need to be changed, but this is a very difficult moment uh, to change treaties. I, would, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't advise any politician to suggest that because we are in very fragile times and changing the, the Lisbon Treaty right now, I, I think it would be committing suicide. Uh, but the treaties need to be changed as soon as uh, things are or become, I hope, quieter or more stable in terms of uh, political frameworks. But I'm always an optimist and I know that we were not counting on uh, uh, September, uh, on 9-11. Uh, um, uh, and it changed the international system uh, in a couple of hours. So we should uh, take some cautious when it comes to say that, oh, this won't happen or this will certainly happen because we never know. We never know when there is a, a distribution of power. We don't know when China will start collecting its uh, investment, for example. It may take five years or 50. And this timing will make a huge difference. And we don't know how Russia will position itself will be more aggressive now or will wait a couple more decades. We don't know. So uh, these things will have a huge impact on several things. Well, COVID-19, as a very good example, we were focused on, uh, on many other things and we reorganized uh, our focus, our, our attention. Even in terms of European Union's integration, we are not talking about integrating uh, the management of health uh, health policies uh, in the EU. Why? Because this happened. If this hadn't happened, the European Union member states would never consider uh, uh, uh, giving part of their sovereignty in terms of managing health policies. So you see, so were we counting on that? No, we were counting on social security, which was put, it, put aside 
to focus on health. So and so uh, history brings its uh, its surprises, uh, and so let's see what what may happen. And I think it's not a coincidence that it is called Lisbon Treaty. It took place in Lisbon, so Portugal plays an important part in yes. the subnationalization <laughs> of European integration. Yes, yes. Uh, Portugal mm -hmm. usually tries to mediate. Um, uh, and I, th I think we have kind of that role in diplomacy in general, just to be the nice guys to try to to to bring everyone together. <laughs> That's usually the position of uh, Portuguese diplomacy. Um, you said that many countries that are bothering us or non-state actors that are really troubling uh, the waters in Turkey are not really a problem for Portugal. What is the problem for Portugal right now? What is it's the security issues. Uh, I would yes. say that's none, to be really honest. <laughs> no, that would be uh, wow. no, no, the thing. Uh, defense and security issues in Portugal, fortunately, are not. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not talking from my perspective because I'm an academic. I study international relations, so I'm a very uh, specific exception. And our colleagues and, let's say, elites in general, or the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, obviously. But when I, if you if you talk to the general public and say, like, what are you afraid of? Well, they would say things like unemployment, uh, pandemics. Uh, I don't know, crisis, um, climate change, <laughs> climate, yes, climate change, even terrorism, just to, to, to, to, to, to be a little bit far fetched in, in the reasons. If you look at uh, um, the uh, Eurobarometer and you look at the concerns of the Portuguese, you look at those. I mean, say now the pandemics, unemployment, terrorism, to, to, say, to say the least. I mean, but uh, but as you can imagine, for a common Portuguese, Russia, well, well it's so, uh, well, Russians will have so many other things to deal with before they get to, to the peninsula that, uh, uh, well, I think we are safe for now, right? Uh, I think it's kind of that vision that uh, we do not have, that's why I, I think it's, um, it's, it's unthinkable to compare Portugal and Turkey in many issues because uh, on the other side, uh, Turkey lives under a continuous sense of securitization, of fear or danger. Of course, I have to, I have to say this, and I'm sorry, but uh, a, a very big part of that is influenced by uh, na official narratives, and they are disproportional. But, but on the other hand as well, we need to accept that there are real dangers and real threats to Turkey because of many things, but mostly for your geostrategic position. Um, okay, and, and, and also because of Turkey's ambition in the Middle East, in the world, which are very legitimate, but which, which come uh, with a cost, which is not a Portuguese case, as you know. We don't want to be the regional leaders of Europe, uh, so uh, we are just uh, happy of being some coast, wide coast here uh, in the Atlantic. Um, that comes with a cost. Um, and in, in, in, in the case of Turkey, if you join that to some political uh, current political situations you have well a very well a very serious context i would downgrade uh, the security um, uh, challenges of course because i think they, they are inflamed by an official narrative but we cannot ignore uh, that dimension as we can in Portugal. In Portugal, we are always demanding the government to diminish the uh, uh, budget for uh, military and defense because people do not perceive threat. It's kind of, a, again, it's a, it's a, why that, that's why I'm a constructivist. It's a question of perception. People do not perceive a, a threat, okay? So uh, even Chinese, uh, they used to be a bigger problem for Portugal than they are right now in the time uh, in the crisis in 2008, 2010, when we had lots of Chinese in Portugal destroying our textile industry uh, because of all, of all the, the, the, those 
prices and dumping policies, they were considered a serious threat to Portugal's uh, security, not military speaking, but economically and so on, but not anymore right now, even though people in general are not aware in Portugal of Belt and Road Initiative, for example, um, which they should be, of course, but it, in terms of perception is not an issue. Portugal sounds like an exceptional case when we take into consideration the global spread of securitization. Well, I'd say, I'd say that we have, uh, there are other countries uh, like Portugal, but as you know, that's, that's again a set of very uh, many variables, right? Our geographical uh, position, um, uh, our belonging to NATO, uh, belonging to the European Union, we do not have uh, big ambitions that would confront uh, regional or, or global powers, for example, uh, mm -hmm. Portugal does not confront, uh, don't, uh, doesn't confront Russia or the United States. We try to have an, an harmony relationship, uh, but that's not. That's I, I would say that's hypocritical. It's just that I mean, no one has interest in Portugal, uh, and that ends up being something nice, right? Uh, and, for that purpose. Uh, and there are other countries like that. Um, but Portugal, I'd say that, uh, mm -hmm. I, and I mean, but, but I'm always uh, referring to popular public perceptions, okay? Public opinion. I'm not saying as an analyst for the Portuguese uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs, okay? That, that would be a, an entirely different uh, uh, uh, discourse. But for common people, if you look, I mean, people are maybe worried about the pandemics or unemployment, but never about Russia. Uh, even well, probably the North Koreans. If you if you if you have if you make people say a name, they say North Korean because they understand that something is going not that well over there. But um, I'd say the public perception is, is they have concerns with many other things, but not um, security threats, not at all. Right. And I remember that you told me that while Europe is now uh, resorting to far right, uh, Portugal is witnessing the rise of left. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, well, in Portugal, we now have a, a, a, a socialist party in government uh, since 2015. Um, well, it's, it's a moderate center left party, party so it's, it's, uh, it's not an extremism. He, he used the government in the previous legislature, it, it used to be supported by the Communist Party. Not the Communist Party was not in the government, but was supporting a parliamentarian speaking uh, the government and uh, the, the left bloc as well. Um, yes, we now have a movement, a, a, a, a, which is the direct translation of the name of the political right wing, far right wing political party called Enough, what, what, we, what we call the Shega, Enough, um, which is the, the, the, the extreme right uh, that we have right now. We have one member of the parliament elected, um, uh, but I would... Portugal will not be immune to this wave, obviously. Um, so that we have to pay attention uh, to, to this as well. But uh, yes, so far we we have been able to manage uh, these um, these effects somehow. Um, not perfectly, but uh, yes. I like least. the word wave you used. I think democracy, democratization is also wave like spread of democracy and also there are some ties which are good. Yes, for yes, yes. You know, you, you know uh, uh, uh, Professor Attila Erhal uh, talked mm -hmm. about the timing in Turkey E relations, right? I mean, the, uh, like waves, like cycles. I would say, like, democratization would also be like that because there are some moments in history uh, when, when, when, beginning in 2001, due to a very unexpected event, then you have the decrease in the number of autocracies, a, a, a, a, a great excitement with democracies and that, that those prospects and probably democracies will work better and so on and so forth. But now people lost their uh, trust, uh, as everyone was saying. And, and so, I mean, uh, I, I, uh, I tend to believe that we need the, the objective is like the economists. 
is like to reduce the amplitude of the wave so that we're not just going to all democracies, all autocracies. It's just like, let's try to make it more moderate in this sense. But timing is very, is very important in international politics, as you know. Thank you so much, Andre. Enes has a question about international promotion of democracy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, first of all. Uh, I'm a new student in the field, but uh, I'm trying to follow up the uh, terrorism news in especially uh, African countries, uh, but mostly in MENA region. Uh, while I try to understand these relations uh, in the countries uh, between uh, Western countries and the governance or um, power holders. When I look at the relations, I can't see any democratic values. So I'm really um, skeptical about the promotion of democracy. Uh, um, when I look at the relations between Western and non-Western countries, uh, I can't see anything. So uh, what do you think about the promotion of democracy in non-Western countries? Thank you. Um, well, I, I'm usually an, an optimistic. I tend to see, uh, well, the, the, the good part of the, of the equation, but I'll give you the, the, the two sides. Well, the first uh, and most important criticism about international promotion of democracy is exactly what you said, which is double standards. If you have an economic interest in Libya, for example, they are not performing, uh, uh, democratically speaking, that well, but you will ignore those faults because you have other interests. That's what the criticals of uh, international promotion of democracy tend to emphasize, to emphasize. And I think it's, it's very legitimate, it's a very legitimate criticism. Um, I, I always try to, to, to, to call attention to this aspect of coherence, right? Uh, I've always criticized the European Union's uh, role regarding Turkey, mostly for this. You've promised uh, accession, then you have to put your money where your mouth is. And it's always this idea, coherence is the backbone of a perceived image uh, of any country. So the, the first criticism is exactly double standards and not applying the rules of conditionality uh, coherently. So I understand what you say and you are right. My uh, optimistic vision just wants you to uh, consider a nuance that there are states that in, cer in certain destinies, in certain, in other countries, may not have those, uh, uh, uh, the, the same um, financial economic interests, and they, and they may genuinely help uh, or try to improve. And I would say that we have now shifted from what we call a more theoretical political promotion of democracy to a much better strategy, which is supporting civil society. So you are not giving money to the state to improve its institutions because it would be uh, unreasonable. But you, for example, if you look at the World Bank, for example, there are hundreds of projects and calls that are open for you. Let's say we are financing opening like uh, schools, building schools in a certain country, okay? That is promotion of democracy and human rights, which is an alternative to what has failed as you recognize and very well. You say, what you're saying is that uh, the Western countries did, weren't, were not worried about the rebels and the Syrians and the refugees when they trained and armed and paid and supported rebels and terrorists and so on because they knew what were what was at stake and that those were those that was the their uh, economic interests so you are completely right about that so but there are alternatives to that and several international organizations are now focusing on that 
they open calls and they say, what we want now is to spend one, uh, 10 million euros uh, building uh, schools or churches or um, mosques or uh, uh, any infrastructures, okay? And those infrastructures will help. We, are, we want to have, we will give money to, let's say, uh, get together a group of 100 students to come and study one here with us, for example. That's another strategy, okay? Um, international organizations, in my opinion, play an important role here rather than states, because international organizations usually, according, well, uh, uh, they, they may tend to look at the bigger picture, unless you are a realist and then you say that they're just an extension of the, the, the state's foreign policy, but anyway, that's uh, open to debate. But international organizations tend at least to have that rhetoric, that narrative saying that well, we are promoting uh, uh, human rights. And how can you promote human rights? You support and you train and protect and you give lawyers and you teach uh, civil society organizations that promote uh, gender equality, freedom of speech and all those uh, fundamental values instead of what they used to do 20 years ago, which was paying directly paying the, the states to create infrastructures that were never created uh, money was diverted to corruption. Now it is yet, but uh, it's in a different way, more controlled. And I think that's an alternative. So I, I, I, I, I, I, I agree with you. Um, yes, because of the reasons that I've presented, I also have some hope in these strategies. And I think that we should do something. I'm, I'm a very in a Kantian inspired. Uh, uh, so I would say that we have a responsibility. Uh, and when I say responsibility to protect is not an, a responsibility to interfere. It's a responsibility to say, well, if you want, we may give you better conditions. Uh, let's discuss what better conditions are. Okay, so in this sense. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Andre. There's another question from another student, Eje. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for your enlightening um, speech. We were uh, really inspired by you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, ask a question uh, a little bit in a different way, hopefully okay. it's uh, relevant. Uh, today, countries, uh, even if the countries that uh, define themselves as democratic, uh, suffer from various uh, human rights violations. Uh, not just human rights, actually, uh, the general rights violations, especially the LGBTQI plus rights or the environmental rights or racial uh, justice or uh, even animal rights. So um, even in the um, democracy promoter countries. So I'm just wondering that how can or should what democracy concept includes uh, from one era to another? I mean, um, which concepts are promoted uh, on what basis? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering that. So thank you very much. You know. You're welcome. Very interesting uh, uh, question, Ajay. Uh, so I would, uh, I would start by pointing at a very contested area again, which is public international law and international organizations. Um, as you know, there are several international conventions to protect uh, animal rights, climate change, uh, violence against women. You have a convention with the name of Istanbul, uh, the, the beautiful city of Istanbul, as you know, very important uh, one. Um, conventions on human rights you have, and I'll give you an example which applies to both to Turkey and the EU, um, and and uh, and sorry, both to Portugal. This is not this, both to Portugal and Turkey, which is the European Convention of Human Rights. If you go to the website of the European Con of the European Court of Human Rights, you will see, for example, the violations by country by article and the decisions of the court and the execution of those decisions by the states. We all know, and I will not spend much time on that, the 
the weaknesses of public international law. We all are aware of that, okay? So let's move on. But when I say that, I use that this, uh, this, your question to underline the role of international organizations. Sometimes uh, states do those violations, for example, and then we have international organizations to call their attention. It happens a lot with Portugal in terms of freedom of expression uh, and um, uh, because of uh, our internal law, sometimes, for example, when you write something insulting another person, Portuguese courts decide to defend those who felt insulted. And then the Portuguese citizens appeal to the European Court of Human Rights and say, Portugal has just violated our freedom of expression that is present in, in this international convention in this case, European Convention on Human Rights. So please tell the Portuguese state and its uh, courts that freedom of expression should be respected and protected by the courts, including the courts. And most decisions of the European Courts of Human Rights in, uh, come to the conclusion that Portugal violated that, that principle. So have you realized what we are talking here? We are talking about a, a further protection of human dignity above the state. And when the Portuguese state does that, uh, and when the Portuguese state pays a fine to the citizen, it recognizes, it acknowledges that it has not protected this human right that has been protected by international obligations, international conventions, in this case of human rights we are talking about a voluntary action. So this, if that's what all of you are thinking, yes. But there is a learning process. As we have socialization in our lives, as kids, we learn the rules. International, the international system can also exert some learning process. Look what constructivists have written about international organization as norm cascades as setting the patterns of behavior. It is wrong to limit freedom of expression. That's what international organizations say to the states. Of course, there are lots of limitations, there are. But if you look at the public international law in the 17th century with the Westphalian Treaty, and right now in 2021, you will see some progress, it's undeniable. The international responsibility of the state was created in 2001 by a, a General Assembly a resolution. The international responsibility for illegal acts by states is calling them responsible for violating international obligations. Which is a, some, it, it's really interesting if you think about it. Is, is it always uh, uh, uh, applied? Not always. Do powerful states escape them many times, but at least they were called into attention. They were, they were um, uh, identified and you don't like to be uh, shamed in public. You don't like to say, you cannot talk about this issue because you're violating uh, um, animal rights all over. So why are you trying to negotiate with us like a trade commerce, a trade agreement on the exportation of livestock, for example? So please don't, right? So, and this may not have the impact that realists would like it to have, but in a long term, um, and this is my optimistic side, we may learn, we may internalize those rules and um, I've, I, I belong to a law department, as, as uh, Didem told you. So I've, uh, I've trained uh, over the last 10 years, lots of judges. And all their judges have not had in, uh, um, in their academic uh, uh, course, they did not have, for example, European Union law. So sometimes they are judging without having, well, they know that there is European Union law, but they, they weren't trained to apply that. And they are not sensitive to international public, public international law because that was kind of uh, pushed aside in their, in their training. But now we insist a lot in our uh, law students. 
So they will be, they, our, uh, our law students have European Union law, our international relations students have European Union law. So we are now training men and women that in 10, 15, 20 years, when they are looking at cases, they will think twice and they know that we have international obligations as well. So, I mean, I have that this is kind of a new layer of protection. Your rights are protected by your state, they are. But what if your state fails? You have the European Convention of Human Rights, you have the European Court of Human Rights, you have lots of other mechanisms. Are they completely effective? No, they fail a lot, but they are much better than they used to be 30 years ago. So there's hope, there's hope. Um, and that there's a learning process that I think that we should pursue and insist on. And as a professor, as an academic, I think that uh, uh, we have an important role here because we are training, we are talking um, to future decision makers. You will be the future foreign uh, uh, policy ministers of Turkey and your own countries. And so I'm really glad to talk to you um, in that condition. So, and you will leave this message. You may not agree with it, but at least you will think about it and you'll be more informed and you will think about it. So um, that's my hope. You are really giving us some hope and optimism. <laughs> Thank you, Andre. <laughs> great, great, <laughs> yes. mission accomplished. Yeah. <laughs> We have two more questions, if you have still time. Yes. So, Doa first, and then Melihcan, you can ask your questions. Hello, sir. Good evening. First Hello. of all, thank you for spending this last two hours with us and for your comprehensive presentation. And as you know, there is a rising tendency towards populism and recent, recently populist leaders came into power or protected their positions. So do you think these popular leaders harms the pro promotion of democracy because they do not behave in favor of democratic ways? Yes, uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely, for several reasons. And the, the, the, the, the easiest one, not to, to, to take so long, but to be short, the easiest one, well, and the most obvious one is that uh, it's not, uh, well, they base their, a narrative on what people want in a certain moment. As you can imagine, uh, the general uh, voters are not worried about international promotion of democracy. You've never, I think you've never watched to see a, a community, uh, electorals in general saying, please increase the state budget for international promotion of democracy. Um, and that has political costs. But sometimes the state understands that it's its mission, maybe its mission, right, to, to diffuse values for ulterior motives that we understand that common uh, voters may not. But populists are not worried about that. They are, they are worried about the political costs or benefits that their decision making will bring. And that is, this, is a very easy, uh, this is a very easy field in this regard. So you know that you will not get votes if you say that you will spend a part of your budget sending to Burkina Faso um, money for vaccines or something, you see? So, so that's why populists uh, uh, uh, harm, as you said, and very well, uh, international promotion of democracy because of this reason for a start, regardless of what they think about democracy. Thank you, sir. So You're Thank welcome. Thank you so much, Andre. It's like Trump who cut off all this international aid. Exactly. <laughs> Milica? Uh, good night, everyone. Uh, thank you for your significant contributions to us. Uh, I'm turning back to a previous question right now. Uh, it's a little bit parallel with Doha's one, but from different point. Uh, my wonder is to reintegrate the countries like Hungary and Poland into European democracy. Do you believe that will this happen with the European Union's initiatives, interferences, or should there be a turning point in domestic politics of these countries? Like, I mean, possible victory of new governing parties in the next couple of years. I'm a little bit asking like a neoclassicalist aspect on that point, top down or bottom up? Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, very interesting. 
I would say that again, this is what I talked to you about this. Ex what, what is more important, external dimension, internal dimension. And I think that we should look at, so social sciences are much more difficult than natural sciences for this reason, for this reason. Um, and uh, all the other scientists don't even call us science, uh, but they have an easy duty compared to us. Uh, because human beings have intention in their behavior. So we cannot reduce that to natural causes, obviously. And that makes it harder. And I would say that the wisest uh, answer to that question is that internal dy dynamics matter because they are the ones that legitimately choose their representatives and we need to respect that. And as a Democrat, I will always stand for that. Even if it means that Donald Trump becomes president again, I will defend the right of the Americans to choose whatever, whoever lunatic they want to choose. Uh, however, however, people, uh, we cannot think about internal dimension without external influences because we do not, we no longer live in isolated islands. The people who vote internally are people who travel, are people who study abroad, are people who have access to CNN, to Euro news, to uh, disinformation, to, to propaganda, to everything. So um, it, it is not possible to isolate the variables. And I don't think it is reasonable to do that. Uh, as a scientist, we need to try to, to, to, to choose uh, uh, and try to be more, uh, pay more attention to one over the other. But, but as, the, as the idea of social sciences, to, to understand the bigger picture, because I may study the internal dimension, a colleague studies the international dimension, and by the end of the day, we really understand what's happening there by uh, uh, conjugating both. And I would say that, yes, the European Union has the obligation for the respect of other democratic countries to force and pressure those countries to recover the quality of their democracies. Because the treaties are explicit. And when Portugal entered, entered with those conditions. So it's not fair for someone not to respect the rules of the game and be accepted and included and so on. So the European Union should uh, should continue and start to emphasize that a lot of legal aspects that we should uh, that we may discuss um, uh, well uh, regarding the treaties but the main idea here is that yes the European Union should continue with limited impact yes but with some impact of course and uh, Hungarians will look at what this government has done and will decide on their own minds, but not alone, not exempted from international influences, because that does not happen at all, probably in North Korea somehow. Uh, but in the rest of the world, it does not happen because we are no longer closed islands, islands and therefore, yes, Hungarians will choose. They may opt for another alternative for their own awareness, but their own awareness is not independent from international, let's say, to, to be, um, to, to, to, to raise some flags, propaganda. You see? Well, you can call it propaganda, you can call it promotion, you can call it value diffusion, whatever you want, but the message, what, what matters is the message. The European Union sends a message. Uh, autocracies are wrong. They are bad and ugly. And citizens listen to that and say, well, Ms. von der Leyen says it's not nice that we have such a government, so probably we will change it or not, right? So it's always an, an intertwining of all these variables. Um, and I, I, don't, I can't even tell you which one is more important. Uh, I think that both uh, are actually uh, very intertwined in a way that is difficult to disentangle. That's why it was so difficult to write my PhD thesis about European Union's influence on Turkish democratization process. Because what is European Union's role? What has been other international organizations role? And what has the Turkish society's role, uh, right? I mean, it's, 
but you by the end of the day you can't and you shouldn't uh, because it's all together thank you so much andre you. if you, thank wish, you. Um, if there aren't any questions we can we can complete our session on this taboo issue democracy <laughs> <laughs> i should say it's been really food for thought for us it's been really inspiring and thank you so much for your optimism and for giving us some hope about this democratization and we are now i think more aware of this internal external intertwined uh, linkages mm, and i think this will raise more debates in the near future and we would love to have you again with us whenever you wish after thank the you in izmir hopefully <laughs> Yes, yes. I, I miss Turkey. I think I, I haven't been to Turkey like I don't know, like for eight years or something. Oh. Like less, like a little bit less, probably. Yes, um, but I, be, yeah. I should be cautious. Actually, it's not uh... <laughs> after the pandemic. Hopefully, yes. You yes. were surprised to see a different Turkey. <laughs> yes, I, I certainly changes do. very quickly. <laughs> And um, so, thank you so much. We are so grateful thank you. to you. It's an honor you. and privilege to have you with us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation, for all your questions and comments. I, I really uh, loved being here. Thank you. Um, and I wish you all the best to all of you for your futures and hope to see you in the United Nations or wherever you want to be. <laughs> Uh, and and just say hello when we do. So all the best to all of you and uh, good luck with your studies. And thank you. And you have my email, Professor Didem can provide it to you if you have any doubts, if you want some reading materials or uh, anything like that, just um, let's keep in touch. Thank you again for the invitation and for your kindness. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andre. You are wonderful. Thank you. So, greetings. Obrigado. <laughs> Obrigado. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank so you. Bye bye. You. Bye bye. Hepinize çok teşekkürler. Görüşürüz. İyi geceler.